So today uh, I'm going to focus on the, the science. Well, first off, who, who am I? Um, so uh, I'm the director of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative. Our program is about a year old, and I'm actually a Bruin myself. So I went to medical school here, and I went to business school here. And I graduated about a year ago, uh, and then I, I helped start this program, and I've been running it for the last year. And we're proud to be one of the first universities in the world with an official cannabis research program. Um, and I met Eugenio about a year ago, and that's when he had the idea to start uh, Cannon Club. And so you're all kind of at the, at the ground floor um, of all this. And so same with Arizona. I met her about a year ago. Um, so it's, it's a lot of exciting stuff that's happening. Today I'm going to be talking about the science of cannabis. You'll have some other talks about the history, the, the sociology, the policy, the business side. But today I'm just about the science. What's in the plant? What does it do to your body? Okay? Those are the two things that we're going to talk about today. So, uh, so today, yeah, so Cannabis Science 101, aka the best class you will ever... Uh, clicker's not working. There we go. The best class you will ever take at UCLA. And in this class, uh, this is the syllabus for this class. Um, we, <laughs> we, uh, we're, we're off to a good start already. And so, uh, you know, this was the cover of Time Magazine about two years ago. And uh, this is totally what I do in my lab, right? We take mice, teach them how to use joints, the little paws. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so this is, this, again, we're still at the, we're the, gr the ground floor of this. We don't really understand a lot about cannabis, uh, both what's in the plant as well as how it affects our body. So it's an area of a lot of active research. And so today, what we're gonna, here's what we're going to talk about. So first off, everybody in this room, you guys make cannabinoids. I'll talk more about that. There's immense medical potential of cannabis. Cannabis is not harmless. There's a lot of significant harms that often get glossed over uh, by the cannabis industry. And there's a tons of barriers to research, and that's why there's so little science, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna take you on a journey through history and science. And our first stop is actually 600 million years ago, okay? And so what was going on 600 million years ago? Well, you might be thinking, uh, you know, dinosaurs or something, but that's not correct because dinosaurs existed about 100 to 150 million years ago. So we're talking about 600 million years ago, way before the dinosaurs. In fact, the life that existed around then was a lot stranger, right? This is around the Cambrian explosion. This is where multicellular life really was starting to blossom and bloom. And that's when we thought, uh, we believe that the endocannabinoid system evolved. Endo meaning internal, cannabinoid meaning cannabis-like, so your internal system of cannabis-like molecules. Okay, and we only discovered this about uh, 25 years ago. All right, so how does the endocannabinoid system work? Well, how many here are, are life science majors who have taken biology? Okay, a few of you guys. So in your body, you can think of having, there's, there's a bunch of keyholes in your body. And there's also a bunch of different keys. And every key can only open a specific keyhole. Just like if you're in a parking lot, there's a bunch of different cars, you have one key that's only gonna turn on the engine of one of the cars, okay? So your body naturally makes these keys. And your body naturally has these keyholes. And the way the cannabis impacts your body is that it mimics, it looks just like the same key that your body naturally makes. So it's not 100% identical, but it's close enough that it can still enter the keyhole turn on the engine. In this case, the engine would be a cellular receptor, right? And once that engine is turned on, your cell is going to do things. It's going to make protein. It's going to express certain uh, uh, genes. <laughs> All right, so the endocannabinoid system is also widely distributed throughout your body. Initially, we thought it was just in the brain. And we initially thought in the brain it regulated things like mood, memory, appetite, sleep. But then we later found out it was, it was also in your peripheral nerves, where it regulates things like pain. It's also on your immune cells, where it regulates inflammation. It's also in your fat tissue, where it regulates energy storage. It's in your bone, where it regulates remodeling. It's on your skin cells, it's in your heart, it's in your pancreas, it's in your gastrointestinal system, it's in your reproductive organs. Right? So the endocannabinoid system is present throughout your body, and it's involved in a wide variety of physiologic processes. Uh, so these are just some of the ones that I just mentioned. And again, if you know the effects of cannabis, if you're familiar with the effects of cannabis, a lot of these make sense, right? Pain, sleep, appetite, right? But other ones are a little more bizarre, metabolism, immune function, right? All right, and the endocannabinoid system is not just present in humans. 
Uh, it's actually present in all vertebrates. So it's everything from birds, dogs, cats, frogs, fish, even certain, form, certain forms of uh, microscopic nematode worms produce endocannabinoids. And again, that's no surprise. This evolved 600 million years ago. So it's preserved uh, throughout a much of higher order life on this planet. All right. Now, about 40 million years ago is when the cannabis plant evolved. And so sometimes I hear this myth that people are like, well, you know, I make cannabinoids and, you know, the, we evolved our bodies in response to the cannabis plant. Right? And that's not true. Our endocannabinoid system came much, much, much earlier. And then the cannabis plant evolved 40 million years ago. And the cannabis plant produces cannabinoids. We produce endocannabinoids. The cannabis plant produces cannabinoids, specifically phytocannabinoids, plant-derived cannabinoids. And there's cannabinoids like THC. There's canna Who here has heard about CBD before? Right? Most of the hands in this room, had I asked this question three years ago, maybe one hand would have gone up, despite CBD having been present in cannabis for 40 million years. So for the longest time, cannabis was synonymous with THC. And that's because in the black market, you know, if you, were, if you had a room this big and you were growing cannabis, space is, space is precious. So if you had a plant that didn't, you smoked it, nothing happened to you, what would you do to that plant? Yeah, get it out of there. You don't want that getting into your gene pool. So through artificial selection, we have been continuously upbreeding the THC in cannabis and inadvertently downbreeding the CBD. And that's because they share the same precursor molecule. So we're shunting the pathway, right? So it's, it's, a, it's in a sense, it's a zero sum game. But there's other cannabinoids too. Those are just two cannabinoids in cannabis that are the most well studied. There's 120 cannabinoids in cannabis and we don't really know what they do, right? They've never been put in a cell or an animal or a human. Okay, now some of you might be wondering, why does the cannabis plant produce cannabinoids? And again, I've heard some, a lot of different theories and we'll talk about a few of them right now. So it's possible that uh, it, there has been some evidence that this might protect uh, the plant from uh, UV damage, okay? And the, the cannabinoids sit in trichromes, which are these, uh, gl these, these glandular structures, these balls of oil and cannabinoids and terpenes that coat the surface of the cannabis plant. And in what part of the cannabis, cannabis plant are cannabinoids most abundant? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I don't know if that's an anatomic structure of uh, plants. Flower. But it's the flower. Right, it's the flower. Actually, Kush, Kush is referring to a specific region where uh, a lot of cannabis is grown, right? It's, it's a region in Central Asia, right? Um, so yeah, it's most present in the flower, right? The, the stalk of cannabis is traditionally used for textiles, right? And that's what we, when we kind of talk about hemp, we're really talking about using the stalk of cannabis, but the flower, that's where all the cannabinoids are. And specifically, they coat the surface of the flower the reproductive part of the plant. And actually, uh, when you're smoking, uh, or when, when you know, the cannabis that you might find in a store, it's, it's actually the unfertilized uh, feminine plants that produce flower with cannabinoids in them, okay? All right, another possible reason, a pesticide, right? So, there are so some of these cannabinoids, some of these terpenes are actually toxic to insects. So if ants munching along, starting to munch in the flower, it's gonna get sick, and that's how the cannabis plant protects itself. Maybe it's also antimicrobial, so they've shown that these compounds can also retard the growth of certain uh, funguses and certain uh, microorganisms. Now, it's also possible that these compounds were designed to attract animals, right? And, uh, you know, and it could be that the effects of cannabis are uh, pleasurable on animals, right? And so, you know, little, little <laughs> critters wandering along, right, it happens to munch on some cannabis and actually enjoys the feelings. Again, complete conjecture. There's never been any proof of this. Another option is maybe it's a, it's a defense agent against, well, actually another question. Why would you want to, why would you want an animal to come over and, and eat your flower and, and, and munch on you? Just it. Yeah. Right, because then they're gonna walk down the road, you know, drop a turd and your new plant might pop up. Because the, there's seeds, right? What's in the flower? The flower eventually turns into the fruit and that's where all the seeds sit. Now, uh, it could also be a defense mechanism, right? So same thing, a bear is wandering around in the woods, happens to come across a cannabis plant, starts munching on it, and you know, an hour later, it's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? 
and it'll never, it'll, it'll never do it again. So it's a toxic agent. But again, we, we, so the short answer is we don't know. We don't know why the cannabis plant evolved to produce cannabinoids that happened to interact with our systems. Okay. Now here's the other interesting thing. Uh, so this is this is a paper published a few years ago out of our own uh, National Institutes of Health, and they were basically saying because the endocannabinoid system is so widely distributed throughout the body and has so many physiologic functions, if we could figure out a way to modulate it, that we could potentially be having therapy for almost all diseases affecting mankind. And the only problem is this, the endocannabinoid system is very poorly understood, it's very complicated, we don't really know how to modulate it well. So yes, cannabis is a modulator, but it's a very blunt tool, right? <laughs> it's a very, um, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, so people are now trying to design drugs that are much more selective when they target the endocannabinoid system. So how can you target one aspect of the endocannabinoid system without creating these global effects? Because compounds like THC create global effects in your endocannabinoid system, some of which might be undesirable. Does it um, have to do with the substrates, unnumbered substrates? Sure, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, for instance, let's say you want a cannabinoid uh, that can give you pain relief but you don't want it getting into your brain. So what do you do is you design something that looks a lot like THC, but you add a compound that won't let it get across the blood-brain barrier. So it just circulates systemically. You don't get high, but it can maybe reduce inflammation or pain in the periphery. All right, so that's what people are working on now. <coughs> All right, so uh, I just gave this away. I was gonna ask what country do you think uh, first started writing about cannabis? And it was actually in China, uh, about three to 4,000 years ago. And actually, this, who, here, who here can read Chinese? Yeah, what is this? Which word? This, this word. That is not. It's not, it's a really ancient, that but like, take it, like, what if it's like the two trees underneath? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so this, you're right, this is not, this is an ancient text, but the modern version looks very similar, and it's ma, right? So that's the, in Chinese, ma, means cannabis, but in Chinese, anesthesia is ma yao. Like well, ma, ma is anesthesia, it's also mean cannabis. And that's because it's the earliest written recordings of the medical use of cannabis were by this gentleman, this kind of mystical emperor, named Shen, Emperor Shen Neng, and he wrote, that, uh, he wrote about the uses of cannabis for things like inflammation and pain. So again, for thousands of years, the Chinese character for pain has been, this, or pain relief specifically, anesthesia, has been the same Chinese character for cannabis. So again, this is, they've recognized this for thousands of years. And actually, when, when Emperor Shen Neng was asked by his court officers, you know, Emperor, how did you, how did you discover the medical uses of cannabis? And to that he stammered, well, I, 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 uh, but I did not inhale. <laughs> actually, actually, I inhaled, and that was the point. <laughs> Thank Frequently. You. I'll be here all night. Okay. Um, so, but it wasn't just in China, right? So, you know, the Egyptians wrote about the uses for pain and glaucoma. The uh, Indian Hindus is one of the most sacred plants of India, and they described the medical uses. In ancient Greece, it was used for inflammation and pain. And in Napoleonic France, they used it for things like depression and insomnia. Right, so this concept of medical cannabis is not new, and it's not even just isolated to Asia or even uh, uh, the Western world. Okay, and in about 1850 is when cannabis was officially listed in the U.S. Pharmacopoeia, which at the time was our official listing of all recognized medicines in this country. And it was, and the, the uses of cannabis were many. Uh, here's some of the described uses of cannabis. Um, you know, and again, science wasn't that great then. And so some of these uses might not make a lot of sense. Maybe they were misguided. But there's a few that I want to draw your attention to. And that's because today, 178 years later, the scientific community is actually having a renewed debate over whether cannabis can increase or decrease alcohol usage whether it can increase or decrease opioid usage, is it useful for pain, and is it useful for seizures? And so again, this is not new information, but 178 years ago, American physicians would prescribe cannabis for these purposes. And even today, modern science is still trying to figure out what's going on here. And actually, pharmaceutical companies, including some of today's largest 
pharmaceutical companies like Eli Lilly actually made cannabis tinctures that you would go pick up at a pharmacy. So as recently as 1940, an American physician could write you a prescription. He would go to a pharmacy and pick up a cannabis tincture bottle made by companies like Eli Lilly. So again, medical marijuana, even though California was the first state to legalize it, when did California legalize medical marijuana? Wow, unison, you guys, wow, all right, you guys knew that. Uh, but that's not a new concept, because in 1940, we had federally legal nationwide medical cannabis. All right, now, uh, so that brings us to uh, the Prohibition era. And it was around the late 1960s uh, that President Nixon was about to, uh, pushing for a, a bunch of uh, legislation related to drugs of abuse. And he actually commissioned uh, a committee and he basically said, I want you guys to tell me what I should do about cannabis. And so, and it was called the Schaefer Commission. And it was a committee made up, or it was a commission made up of uh, law enforcement, congressmen, doctors, scientists, lawyers, uh, the whole kind. And they spent three years working on this report and published a 500 page report. And they basically recommended the pre to the president that the potential harms of this were, did not justify uh, any sort of criminalization, and they recommended that the possession of cannabis uh, not be an offense. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, so 19, in the 1970s, we passed the Controlled Substances Act, which created a, a bunch of, do you want to close that door? Or is it hard for like people? Ten people ah, shit. Okay. <laughs> so that's okay. I'll talk louder. So uh, we created the Controlled Substances Act, and that created all these tiers for drugs. Schedule one drugs being the most dangerous drugs, and having no medical use. Schedule two drugs also being defined as dangerous drugs, but having some medical use. All right. So we're gonna play a little trivia now. You're gonna go. You're gonna go. Schedule one and schedule two. All right. You're gonna. Okay. So uh, heroin. One. Cocaine. Two. Oh, wow. It's an anesthetic. <laughs> opium. Or actually, uh, no, I got a better one. Uh, actually, yeah, sure, why not? Opium. One. Two. 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 I don't remember which one I put next. Two. 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 I think it's actually, you know what? Ah, oh, damn it. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. All right, now, okay, what do we say about opium? Two. Right, good. Cannabis. One. 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 Methamphetamine. Two. 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 Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so. Makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, and that's true. That, that, that's definitely it. So methamphetamine uh, is used in drugs like Adderall. Cocaine is sometimes used as an anesthetic. Uh, topical anesthetic. Uh, opium is made into uh, opioids, things like things that use like morphine. Right? So that's how they justified it being a Schedule Two drug. And again, cannabis has been labeled a Schedule One drug for half a century, and that has limited a lot of the research into that. And I'll talk more about that later. Okay. So for the last 50 years, not only has cannabis been a Schedule One drug, but there has also been a monopoly on the production of cannabis in this country, okay? So there is one legal, federally legal cannabis farm in this country. And who knows where it is? Mississippi. It's in Mississippi. So for the last 50 years, only one organization, one license in all of America has been allowed to grow cannabis. And they grow this cannabis for research purposes. They mail it to researchers to study uh, the harms, essentially. And so this is the farm in Mississippi. It's at the University of Mississippi. So again, for the last 50 years, this has been the only source of cannabis in this country that is federally legal. And to this day, it is still the only source that is legal. So as a researcher, if I want to actually get a hold of LSD, there are multiple chemical companies I can call and order LSD from. But if I want cannabis, I have to go to this one source, and if they don't have the inventory that I want, or if they're out of supply, or if they're giving me bad customer service, I'm, I have no option. And so monopolies, they're good for the person who has a monopoly, but they're bad for the consumer, just in general, right? Um, and actually, up until a few years ago, they didn't even offer CBD, CBD cannabis. So all you had was high THC cannabis to study. So if you wanted to study CBD, you're out of luck. It wasn't in supply, much less any other of the 118 other 
cannabinoids in cannabis. So, and so again, you know, contrast this. So this is what the federal government is growing, but then contrast this with what's happening up in the Emerald Triangle in Northern California. So the cannabis that is, you know, that you can now walk into a store and get, it's being grown by, you know, like dudes like this with the mullet, right? <laughs> and so, you know, we aren't, it's unfortunate because we're not studying the right stuff. The cannabis that we're studying, it's been criticized that it does not resemble the cannabis that is being widely used uh, by the, by the, by the uh, public, okay? So when we study the federal government's cannabis, do we have external validity of our results? All right, so, 1996, California legalizes cannabis. And by 2017, we, we estimated maybe a million Californians had their physician recommendation and therefore could legally purchase cannabis. The reason why it's an estimate, we did not keep records. It, it, you know, it was chaos. Medical cannabis in California was chaos. The law that legalized and regulated it was literally a paragraph. Whereas the laws that now regulate cannabis today hundreds of pages, right? But it was 1996, you know, we did the best we could, we wrote up, it was a proposition measure. As of January 2nd this year, when anybody over the age of 21 can purchase cannabis, the amount of legal purchasers of cannabis jumped from roughly a million to about 27 million people over the age of 21, right? So that's a, that's a huge increase. And that means today, California has the largest legal population, the largest legal purchasing population out of any state or country in the world. So you guys are in the middle of this. So again, whether you like it or not, this is going to affect you. And in fact, Canada goes completely legal later this year, but we're still bigger than Canada as a state. Right? We're cooler than Canada too. Yeah. No, yeah, I love that. All right. So, what, let, now let's, let, let's start talking, let's dive a little bit deeper now into what is actually in the cannabis plant. So again, like we said, cannabis plant makes cannabinoids. Up to 120 cannabinoids have been identified, of which we really only know, we really only know much about probably less than 10 of these cannabinoids. Uh, you know, the two that I'm gonna talk about today just because they're the most well studied, THC and CBD. And one way that you can draw a quick dichotomy between those, THC psychoactive, CBD non psychoactive, all right? But it gets, there's a lot more subtlety and nuances. And if you look at the difference between the two molecules, the only difference is that this has a closed ring structure, whereas over here, these two electron groups are gonna form a bond right here. Uh, or sorry, over there, they, these two electrons form a bond with this oxygen group. So that subtle difference makes a massive difference in terms of the effects of these compounds. Is there resonance? You know, you're throwing some terms at me that bringing me back to sophomore year of college. Um, I don't think there's residents in this structure. Yeah. yeah, THC for sure. That benzene ring right there. Wow, I haven't said that word in like 10 years. Uh, okay, so THC. Let's talk about THC. Uh, it can alter consciousness, right? So this, this high that you get, if you want to boil it down to scientific terms, it's alterations in your perceptions of time, taste, tactile sensation, right? Auditory perception. It can uh, stimulate appetite. And it can release dopamine that's responsible for the euphoria and that's also responsible for the addictive potential of cannabis, which I'll talk more about later. It can also impair memory. Uh, it can also, yeah, can you tell them to be quiet out there? Hey guys, you have a class going on over here. It's kind of loud out here. Can you see it down, please? We should all say thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it can also impair memory. So while you're acutely intoxicated, it's going to impair your, your, your memory during that period of intoxication. It can also impair motor coordination. And so uh, what do you think is your increased risk of a car accident while you're acutely stoned? Is it 100x? Is it 5x? What do you guys think it is? 20x? Any other guesses? 30. It's actually about a doubling. You have about a, a doubling of your increased risk of crashing with cannabis. Um, but what do you guys, do you think for alcohol is it higher or lower? Yeah, so for alcohol it's about a six to eight x if you're over the BAC of 0.08. Now, here's the problem. We don't know what a safe cutoff is for cannabis and we have no way to measure it. So this is actually really tough right now. If a cop pulls you over and you are stoned, how does he prove that you're impaired 
right? The same, the same sobriety tests for, for alcohol don't work for cannabis. It's affecting different parts of your brain. So this is a problem right now. Okay, so let's talk about CBD. In contrast to THC, CBD is non-psychoactive, no effects on motor coordination, doesn't cause any euphoria, doesn't actually stimulate appetite, and it actually might even reduce the psychoactivity of THC. And so there's studies that show when you administer CBD and THC at the same time, you can actually reduce the amount of psychoactivity and some of the potential negative side effects of THC, such as impairments in cognition. So again, you can see how for thousands of years, the cannabis that we used was probably low amounts of THC, low amounts of CBD, and probably some of all these other compounds. Whereas cannabis today, the THC has gone through the roof, and the CBD has plummeted down to near zero. In fact, most of the dispensaries that you go to now, any cannabis you might buy, the CBD is like 0.1%, 0.01, THC is like 20%. You know, that this is not the cannabis that, that, that we've utilized as a, as, a, as, a, as a species for thousands of years. Yeah. I mean, they still offer products that are solely CBD. It's not just that, like, the THC isn't the main focus necessarily like, all around, but I can see where you're getting at to where THC is a higher priority for some people. But I mean, they do offer Correct. Sort of side of And that's only really in the last, like, two years. Yeah. Correct. And we're also in the most sophisticated cannabis market. Right, so if you find yourself in a different state, you know, if you find yourself in, um, whatever, Texas buying black market cannabis, it's gonna be THC through the roof, virtually. <coughs> are they, are they out of, did they just get out of the class? What's up? Uh, you don't want it to produce a psychoactivity and cause CBD is similar to something. It competes with, uh, well, that's a great point. It's actually, it actually might be an antagonist at the same receptor that THC, the same receptor that THC binds to, that same key that THC is, that the same keyhole that THC enters, CBD might also enter that and actually decrease the amount of activity of that receptor. Now, uh, there's some areas where they both overlap. So THC and CBD, they both have anti-pain properties. They both have anti-seizure properties, right? They both have uh, anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, and, in, and in animal models, they both have anti-tumor properties, actually uh, retarding the growth and spread of certain types of cancer cells. Right? But again, these are only in animal studies. We don't know what they look like in humans. Now, CBD is a really interesting compound. And so this is a, this is a quote. Uh, Dr. Volkow actually runs the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Right? So this is the government agency tasked with studying the harms of all these drugs. And she was called in front of Congress to testify about CBD. And she basically talks about how CBD has anti-seizure properties, antioxidant properties, it's a neuroprotectant, it's an anti-inflammatory, it's an analgesic, which means anti-pain, anti-tumor properties, anti-psychotic properties. THC, pro-psychotic. CBD, anti-psychotic. They're doing clinical trials in Germany right now for the use of CBD for schizophrenics. Um, and anti-anxiety properties. So again, same plant. One has an open ring, one has a closed ring. Dramatically different <coughs> effects. Right, so the plot thickens as to what's going on here. <laughs> All right, so here's some other cannabinoids. Um, and again, there's 120 cannabinoids. Everything from cannabigerol to cannabichromine, right? What else is in cannabis besides cannabinoids? Terpenes. Terpenes. Okay, so terpenes also are known, you might also have heard of them, uh, essential oils, right? And so whenever, you, so whenever you smell, generally when you smell a plant, when you smell a flower, or you smell fruit, and you yeah. smell something, you're smelling terpenes, you're smelling essential oils, okay? So, uh, for instance, cannabis produces a terpene called linalool, or certain types of cannabis produce linalool. It has certain properties. It can be, uh, it can have anti-anxiety properties, anti-pain properties. But linalool is also found in lavender, right? So these terpenes are not unique to cannabis. And so actually when you smell cannabis, you're not smelling cannabinoids, you're smelling terpenes, right? Which is interesting because people will smell cannabis and be like, that smells like dank stuff. <laughs> but the THC concentration you're not smelling the THC concentration, you're smelling terpenes, but somehow people have associated that, that with, with the strength. So you can smell like really like loud, 
<laughs> Sorry, what'd you say? Yeah, you're saying it could, it's, it's, yeah, you could have cannabis that has a really strong aroma, but the THC content is actually not that potent. It's quite hard. Right? 30 years ago, the FDA approved THC. Uh, it was FDA approved for weight loss in HIV and nausea and vomiting during chemotherapy. But anecdotally, I mean, this is, there was never a comparison, but anecdotally, patients said that they tried Marinol, some of them didn't like it, and they preferred cannabis. And it, maybe it's because of the other compounds in cannabis. We don't know. Uh, Epidiolex is a cannabis extract. Oh, so this is actually THC synthesized in a lab. This is CBD taken out of cannabis and purified. And this was just FDA approved about a month ago. First ever cannabis-derived medicine approved in America. So you guys are living through historic times. There it is. Talk about it. Quick question. Um, have you heard about any of the recent side effects that have been associated with epidiolites? Um, I haven't seen that in a cannabis, but <laughs> cannabis-derived products well, are pretty pertinent with that. I see what you're saying. So yes, there are side effects of epidiolites, but there are side effects of cannabis too. It's just cannabis. Epidiolites is rigorously studied in, in tons of individuals, and they're tracking everything, every side effect, whereas cannabis doesn't necessarily have that. And so, uh, so you can't really say that this has more or less side effects than, than cannabis, right? And then this is uh, Sativex. So this is a one-to-one -one combination of THC and CBD, not approved in America, but approved throughout Europe for muscle spasms. So again, we have you know, FDA-approved versions of these cannabinoids. So the real question is, is the answer a highly purified form of a plant-derived cannabinoid? Is the answer a synthetic, completely pure version of cannabinoid? Or you do want a, a whole plant extract that has hundreds of compounds in it? We don't know, right? There's certain difficulties when you're working with a complex plant extract. How do you make it the same each time? What in it is actually causing the effect? All right, and then uh, the other thing that you often hear people tout is that cannabis is a, is, a, is, this plus, is, a, is a panacea, right? It's good for everything under the sun. It cures cancer. It cures the fungus that grows in between my toes, right? <laughs> and, and whenever you hear those claims, I, I want you to be skeptical. And I want you to be skeptical like this chihuahua is skeptical when he hears things like this. <laughs> and that's because the placebo effect is a real thing. And the placebo effect is strong, especially with cannabis, because cannabis has this miraculous reputation. The placebo effect is even stronger. All right, so let's talk about the harms of cannabis. Again, cannabis is not a harmless substance. All right. And that my harm slide completely died. Why is that? Okay. So I'll talk. <laughs> Wait. Wait. Oh, okay, cool. All right. So uh, let's talk about the number of deaths caused by other commonly encountered substances in America. So tobacco, this is the number of Americans that die a year. Tobacco is still the number one killer in our country in terms of substances. Uh, actually, these two are flipped. It should be alcohol kills uh, around 80,000 Americans a year. Uh, opioids are killing about 60,000, and the reason this number is scary is because it's rising fast, right? We're in an opioid epidemic. But even things like uh, NSAIDs, this is like ibuprofen, aspirin, Aleve, Motrin, these actually kill a few thousand Americans a year. Why, why does it kill them? Not the liver, that's, that's Tylenol. <laughs> stomach, stomach ulcers. Generally, it's older patients who take it for arthritis, pain, and then they find that they're bleeding through their stomach, and by then they've been bleeding for weeks or months, right? Now, how many direct deaths due to cannabis? Zero. zero. Right, so yeah, it's, it's zero. Uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, for opioids, we have an American dying every 10 minutes from opioids, whereas we've had essentially zero deaths from cannabis in history. But I put a big question mark here because I'm sure there's someone who's gotten stoned and, and crashed their car right, or someone that smoked contaminated cannabis and got like a lung infection from fungus. So again, maybe indirect deaths due to cannabis, okay? But there's a, there's a statistic that a lot of people don't talk about, and I really want to draw attention to it today, because it's something very serious about cannabis that nobody talks about. And it's this number right here, I want you to pay close attention to it. 118, 721. Those are the amounts of lives 
Cheetos lost every minute because of the hot dog. <laughs> it's a travesty. <laughs> no one is doing anything to protect Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody sign them. But, but just because there's not people dropping dead on the street doesn't mean that cannabis isn't harmless. There's significant harms. Um, let's, this is the math I actually did. Yeah, actually <laughs> I actually sat down and did this. So. Okay, so let's talk about some significant harms. So, schizophrenia. So, for folks who have a family history or genetic risk for schizophrenia, using cannabis will actually increase the risk that you actually develop schizophrenia. And that's serious. This is a debilitating lifelong disease, right? This is really bad for folks who have a genetic predisposition. What about the developing brain? So until what age does your brain develop? 25. Yeah, 25, right? Um, and so what we find is that people that use cannabis, and, and the earlier you use it and the heavier you use it, we find uh, associations with worse outcomes in IQ, educational attainment, mood disorders, right? And so the developing brain shouldn't be using anything, not cannabis, not alcohol, not nicotine, not other drugs of abuse, okay? Uh, let's talk about dependency, abuse, addiction. So I, sometimes I hear people go, okay, maybe cannabis is psychologically addicting, but it's not physically addicting, and that's not true. Because what you'll have is people who use cannabis regularly, if they stop, not all of them, but some of them will go into physical withdrawal. And one of the definitions of a compound that's physically addictive is withdrawal symptoms when you take it away. So cannabis is psychologically addictive. It releases dopamine, causes euphoria. It's also physically addictive, all right? But it doesn't happen to everybody. So our, the, the, our best evidence is that roughly about 10% of people who try cannabis will go on to have a dependency in their lifetime. And that same number for alcohol is maybe 14, 15%. Heroin, it's about 23%. Nicotine, 32%. Nicotine, one of the most addictive compounds known to man. So again, cannabis is addictive, but not everybody. And most people don't get addicted to it. But wouldn't you describe that addiction as something more similar to like, like if you play a game and get a dopamine hit from it and then you stop using it, like, wouldn't you describe it? It's not an addiction. Is it like the same type of addiction as like say nicotine, which kind of it's in the cycle? It is itself. right. So, so maybe maybe something like a, a video game you might say more is, is is psychologically addictive, not so much physically addictive. But cannabis is physically addictive too. You go through withdrawal symptoms. So if, again, not again. This doesn't happen to everybody, but for some folks who use cannabis daily, if you tell them to stop, they're going to go through withdrawal. They're going to have uh, irritability, trouble sleeping, right? Changes in appetite, changes in mood. They're going to feel depressed or anxious. It happens. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to get through the last bit of my slides here. Um, let's talk about mood disturbance. And so mood is things like depression and anxiety. And what we find is that people who use cannabis tend to report being more depressed and more anxious than people that don't use cannabis. But what we don't know is that whether the cannabis is causing the depression or the anxiety, or is it people who are depressed and anxious use cannabis? We don't know. Mm. But again, anecdotally, you hear stories where people who you know, are self-medicating with cannabis, sometimes it appears that it might be making the situation worse. So again, we don't know the answer to this. Uh, what about cognition and memory? So what we find is that amongst adults, so we're talking about a brain that's already developed, amongst adults, people that use cannabis versus people that don't perform slightly worse on tests of memory, focus, and learning. But what we find is that after they stop using cannabis for, for a few weeks, those deficits tend to generally correct. So what we think is that it's not that it's caught for this again, for in, in the developed brain that starts using cannabis, we think that you know, the circulating, because the THC stays in your system for sometimes weeks, we think that circulating THC is causing those impairments in cognition as opposed to any permanent damage to the brain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, what about lung cancer? Increased risk of lung cancer? Decreased risk? Neutral. 
Depending if you're smoking. Let's say smoking. smoking. Yeah. Smoke, combusting smoking cannabis. Risk of lung cancer. Survey says. Uh, 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 no risk. What? Wait. So what they found is that this is actually research done at UCLA. If you guys are curious, look it up. Tashkin. T a s h k a n. So for whatever reason, look. I'm just telling you the evidence. For whatever reason, for whatever reason, we find that even people that smoke heavily and for a long time, no increased risk of lung cancer. But was that smoked through glass or was it smoked through like a tobacco product? <laughs> smoked in general. I'm serious. That's a general. serious question. That's it's smoked it's in like, general. They basically, they basically just go to people, they go, Did you, do you smoke cannabis, tobacco, okay. or nothing? Cannabis, gotcha. tobacco, nothing. And what they find is that tobacco, lung cancer, lung disease, people don't smoke anything. Cannabis. Yeah, we don't know why. Maybe people that smoke cannabis are also eating better or you know healthier in other ways that offset it. We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Uh, here's that dependency chart I just talked about, so you guys can see the, the relative risk of becoming dependent on these substances. All right. So let's talk about the future. We talked about the history. We talked about the current state. Let's talk about the future. So cannabis is actually going global. I actually just got back from Colombia, the nation of Colombia, where I was teaching. Uh, the first medical cannabis class the country ever had with some doctors there. And so cannabis is spreading throughout Europe, uh, Latin America, Af there's a bunch of countries in Africa that are legalizing medical cannabis. And this is not a California phenomenon, this is a global phenomenon that's happening. And I want to talk about a few interesting areas where uh, our research initiative is pushing forward right now into uh, these issues. So one is on the opioid epidemic. And so there's a few reasons why we think cannabis could play a potential positive impact uh, on, on the opioid epidemic. So number one, we know that uh, cannabis, there's evidence that cannabis is effective for chronic pain. Specifically, the most evidence we have is for nerve pain. As for the other types of pain, we don't have great evidence yet. But hey, if you can treat someone's chronic pain, maybe they never need to start opioids. Maybe they can reduce the amount of opioids that they need for pain relief. Um, and so we also find that when you combine cannabis and opioids, you get greater pain relief than either one alone. There's synergy. And that's actually because your endocannabinoid system is actually linked with your endogenous opioid system. The two are linked. They, they have an interplay. And actually, the, the, we think that the runner's high is actually a combination of endorphins, your body's version of opioids, and endocannabinoids. The two systems are linked. Uh, we also find that states that pass medical cannabis laws tend to see lower overdoses opioid overdoses compared to states that don't. And also, this is very speculative, but we know that cannabinoids can reduce inflammation. And we know that brain inflammation is implicated in chronic pain, it's also implicated in uh, addiction and, and things like depression. All right, uh, let's talk about the anti-tumor properties of cannabinoids. And again, everything I'm about to talk about has pretty much only been done in animals. We have no idea if it's gonna be true in humans, Oftentimes, things that show up in animals don't show up in humans. So I want to give that huge caveat. We're not talking about a cure for cancer right now. We're talking about a few rat studies where cannabinoids are able to slow the growth of cancer cells. So, uh, and again, it's only certain types of cancers. There's so many different types of cancers, right? We've really only studied this against certain types of cancer. So it's able to slow the growth, right? It's able to prevent the spread of, of certain types of cancer cells. The other interesting thing is, unlike chemotherapy, Traditional chemotherapy targets cancer cells and non-cancer cells. Cannabinoids seem to only target cancer cells. They're non-toxic to healthy cells. So a lot of the side effects of chemotherapy, right, your hair falling out, right, the, the, uh, your gastrointestinal system, the lining of that eroding away, that you, you theoretically wouldn't get that with cannabinoids. Also, if you talk about a patient who has cancer, they have issues with pain, appetite, right, Things like that. And so you talk about maybe the cannabis might also be improving those that, that quality of life for that patient. Let's say let's say this is so early, let's say this doesn't do much at all. How could it help quality of life in these cancer patients? Um, the other thing is uh, cannabis or certain cannabinoids are actually neuroprotectants. So this is the patent. The name of the patent is cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. This patent filed back in 2003. And here's the interesting thing. Guess who filed and owns this patent? Yeah, it's actually the, uh, the US Department of Health and Human Services. So they're the branch that oversees the CDC, the NIH, Medicare, right? 
Um, so this is actually from research that done at the government, uh, at the National Institutes of Health. And if you read the body of this patent, it talks about how cannabinoids could be useful for neurodegenerative diseases, things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Uh, here we go, right here, this is a quote from the patent that you can go look up if you're interested. And the last thing is the anti-inflammatory properties of cannabinoids. And so, like I said, your immune cells have cannabinoid receptors on them. And when stimulated, it decreases the activity of that immune cell and decreases the release of pro-inflammatory compounds. Why is this important? Cro chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, pain, all of these have inflammation as a component. Life is inflammatory. <laughs> Right? Really, life is everything you're exposed to. It's in your own, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you can't really take steroids every day. Even something like ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is anti inflammatory, but we just said if you take it every day, you'll bleed through your stomach. So now you have an anti inflammatory that potentially might have less, at least less direct toxic side effects. Is this proven already? This is in animal studies. Again, not in human studies. Okay, but that's where the interest now is headed then there's a bunch of clinical trials around the world going on right now for the use of cannabinoids for things like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, right? These are all autoimmune inflammatory conditions. But the problem with realizing a lot of this potential is that we have these research restrictions and they exist to this day, right? Schedule one, you gotta get special licenses, you gotta get a special safe, the DEA, the DEA comes and does a site inspection, they do background checks on everybody in your lab, long waiting periods, paperwork, and it's really hard to get funding to study the benefits of cannabis. You can get funding to study the harms from the government, but it's really hard to study the benefits. So actually, our research initiative is, is at this point, we're funded by the philanthropic community. We're funded by donations. We got a little bit of seed funding from UCLA, and now we're entirely funded by donors. Okay, So I'm constantly having to fundraise to keep our activities going. How much do you need right now? I got some here. Hey, hey, oh, there you go, all right. I need five. I'll talk to you afterwards. So <laughs> and, and so uh, our mission, the mission of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative is to understand the impacts of cannabis on health. But we define health very holistically. Physical health, mental health, social well-being, right? Oftentimes the social well-being aspect gets cast aside when we just think of health as you don't have, a, you don't have any disease. Does that mean you're healthy? No. Let's talk about your, your support circles, your community, right? Um, you can take a look at our website. You can learn about some ongoing research. We have education resources. There's some videos that we got. Um, and I'll end with that and take some questions. Is that the clock? So you had your hand up. My question is about the THC part about the memory information. Uh, personally, I felt that when I would slow, like for like during the summer, like for a long period of time, I felt that I would slow down. And honestly, like I was a bit worried because I felt like, like in terms of my own lag, I would notice I lag and like my memory would be impaired. And then over like after two weeks after, I would not lag as much. But I felt that my my concern going forward is is that a long term kind of impairment in terms of memory and function? Because I got it. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how old are you? Uh, 23. Okay. Well, so here's the thing. What you were describing there, it's probably, like, we know that when you're acutely stoned, you're going to suffer all sorts of deficits in your cognitive domain. But THC is impairing that. And like I said, because it's stored in your fat and it tends to circulate throughout your body, those effects could linger at, at a very mild level, but it can linger for sometimes weeks. Right? And now, you're asking about permanent impairment. I mean, the good news is you're already in your 20s. When you're using so the, our studies, the studies show that adults, right, you're kind of out of that critical window where your brain's developing. Adults that use cannabis like that, those those deficits, uh, again, they tend to correct with uh, uh, abstinence, right? So it's, you get it out of your system, and those impairments generally go away, as far as we can tell. And the part about that is because, like, some of my roommates, they need a high amount of THC in order to get the same stone back. And for me, I do not want to build a tolerance. They keep I would rather microdose because for me it helps me to sleep 
And honestly, I do not want to build up that tolerance because I find that it helps me for anxiety and helps me sleep. But I'm worried that what would be better for me to microdose or let's go build up a tolerance, or would it be that in gaps during stressful periods of time to smoke a lot? And then mm -hmm. I'm gonna like no comment. Yeah. 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 You know, just, and just, again, just keep. Yeah, it's just it's really. There's no evidence to guide. Like that question you asked. There's there's no evidence to guide that, right? And, and, and in fact, again, you know, we. Yeah, there's just there's no evidence to guide that. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, question. Uh, chemically and the sativa. Oh, great question. Uh, indica and sativa. Honestly, I think that classification system is nonsense because there's no quality assurance. Who determines what's an indica? Who determines what's a sativa? Right. At any point from when the grower grows to when it gets in the store, it passes hands ten times. And someone could change the strain name. So be like, oh, I think this is an indica, sativa. Right. That doesn't really matter. Actually, indica and sativa initially referred to the morphology of the plants. Indica plants being shorter and bushier, sativa plants being skinnier and taller with, with wide, skinny, long leaves, and they came from different parts of the world. But at some point, this myth kind of developed that these different types of morphologic characteristics would be predictive of the effect on your body. A more accurate word is something called chemovar. What, is, what are the chemicals in that strain? That's more predictive. So don't, I think the strain thing is probably nonsense, or the, the indica sativa. Yeah. So, like, if we did want something for sleeping, then we'd have to get something with high CBD percentage, not... Uh, no, I, we don't know. There actually has been so little research into the impacts of these compounds on sleep. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, what they do is they take... They've studied pure THC, they've studied pure CBD, but they also study it in healthy folks to see how it affects their healthy sleep cycles. Mm -hmm. They've never taken someone who has sleep problems and administered it to them. So we don't know. I mean, there's some evidence that for, uh, for chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, sleep apnea, in those conditions, when you're giving, in the studies where they gave cannabis to people to treat the pain, right, to treat the multiple sclerosis spasticity, they noticed that their sleep also improved. Right, but is it because the pain's improving? That's why the sleep improved? Or is it directly improving the sleep? We don't know. So it's unknown. Uh, you think who else raised their hand up? Yeah. Uh, how much do you think cannabis influenced evolution? Not evolution in a biological sense, but in a more cultural sense. That, you know, actually, um, I don't know. What? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, you know, there's, there's, okay, well, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, if you're talking about within the last decade, I'm sure there's, it has impacted cultural evolution. But if you're talking about any sort of physical evolution, I, I don't know, and it's probably the time scale is probably too short for it to actually have impacted much too the course of much evolution. It's hard oh, to say. Like, okay. hard, hard to know. I don't know. I'd be speculating. Yeah. Yeah. Rap game, I'll yes. tell you. <laughs> well, if Indica and Sativa are not good terminologies, then what's the best way to predict what effect you're going to get from cannabis? And, and that's the problem, right? So we don't know what's the best way to predict what cannabis for what type of individual. And that's the goal of research, to figure out what type of cannabis or what combinations of cannabinoids for what type of person, right, your genetics, your psychographics, for what type of person, for what kind of condition is going to be most efficacious or could actually cause you harm? Like again, if you're someone who maybe has this type of depression, using cannabis might make it worse, right? If you're someone who is prone to addictive, uh, you, have a, you have genetic risk for being addicted to things, you have the high likelihood of being addicted. So that's where the research needs to go, yeah. So CBD, is that like the precursor to THC? Yep. I'll come back to you there's no more. Nice and uh, entertaining talk. So as you said, uh, that it is almost 120 compounds, right? Uh, cannabinoids. Yeah. So... And ben does, he takes that strain that seemed to uh, retard tumor growth, and he'll break it into four sections. So he'll take that strain, those 300 compounds, and he'll break it into a group of 75, a group of 75, a group of 75, and he'll do it again. I'll notice really that these until he <laughs> narrows it down to maybe it's maybe all you need is three to mint that to get most or all of the effect. Maybe you need 17 to get most or all the effect, or maybe you do need all hundreds of compounds. No one knows, right? But he's starting to dive in and again. Science for the first time What's this ever. Didi Marie. Where's he at? He's at uh, Technion University in, in, in Israel. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Who hasn't asked a question yet? You haven't asked one. Yeah. Um, are, so, 
I know that Irish and Elegy teaching this class and that you've gone to Columbia to teach them more about cannabinoids and um, the whole subject. So um, what kind of research are you, are, are you doing any form of research on this as uh, like right now? Or yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a bunch of studies going on at UCLA right now. A lot of them pertain to how do you treat cannabis use disorder, so people who are addicted, how do you help them quit? We have studies looking at pure CBD for various forms of uh, pediatric neurologic diseases, things that are seizures, tubular sclerosis, things like that. Um, and then there's a whole host of studies that we're designing and preparing right now. Everything from, uh, we're working with a bunch of former Bruins who went on to have very successful basketball careers in the NBA, and they're now coming back to us and saying, hey, I don't think you guys realize this, but most of the NBA players are apparently using cannabis while they're playing. And it's not being documented, it's not being addressed, no one knows, and we want to shed light on it, we want to figure out what it's actually doing. Is it good? Is it bad? You're not drinking anything. That's why it needs to be studied, right? So, you know, everything from understanding cannabis use in athletes to understanding the impacts of cannabis uh, to uh, treat chronic pain patients who are using opioids, what are the impacts of cannabis on sleep? Um, so these are all, all uh, the, we have another study that we submitted a grant for, the use of uh, CBD for autism, um, the use of cannabinoids to actually pre prevent or slow the onset of dementia, again, going back to those neuroprotective properties. The problem is we were designing all these studies, but they were also simultaneously trying to fundraise for, for these studies, so it's difficult. Um, let's see, did you have any new questions? I, or actually, you haven't asked a question. I just wanted to know all about it seems like you said it's doing a lot of research more on like the STEM side. Is there any chance of anything on the social equity issues? Great, yeah, so we have another working group actually. So it's people from the uh, School of Public Policy. They're trying to study the uh, social justice aspects. Um, so the interesting thing about when Ken, you'll have another lecturer who's part of that group who, who will actually talk. Brad Rowe is speaking, right? So you'll get a chance to pick his brain okay. on, the, on the public policy aspects, the social justice aspects. What's really cool about cannabis legalization in California, the law retroactively expunges all criminal activities related to cannabis. Number one, right? So there's people who are petitioning to get out of jail right now because they're in there for like a felony for selling cannabis. Uh, it also creates um, a reinvestment. A lot of the tax dollars are specifically <coughs> supposed to go back towards communities that have the highest rates of drug arrests. Mm -hmm. That's another thing the law does. Mm -hmm. And then specifically, the city of LA gives priority for cannabis licenses, gives priority cannabis licenses to people who've actually gone to jail for, for drug arrests, right, and, and things like that. So they're trying to, that's part of the social equity program of that. It's called the Social Equity Act, isn't it? Well, uh, well right? hold on. So there's the Social Equity Program that LA City passed. Mm -hmm. The state has not necessarily passed its own social equity program related to cannabis. Um, any other questions? Maybe one, one, one more question, then we'll call it. Oh, 707, yeah. One last question. Anybody who hasn't asked Do you like backwards? What's up? Do you like backwards? <laughs> Say it again? Do you like backwards? What's no. that? Oh. <laughs> oh. He said I do. Hey. Cool. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.